Those of you that have been following along with the episodes of Sailing Fair will know that we've just had a full re-rig and I've been promising a technical special on this. In fact, this is the first part of a two-parter because there's so much uh, information to try and get in this and, and you don't want uh, an amateur sailor like me trying to give you instructions. So we've got one of the best riggers in the world that we drafted in, Jade from the Boat Shed Wales, who's done a brilliant job on this re-rig and uh, he's responsible for a couple of boats in the Golden Globe race, so his credentials don't really come any better. Um, but there's a lot to get through, so let's get started. I'm gonna start with these terminations. One of the first decisions was whether to go for swage or mechanical fittings for the wires. Swage fittings are pressed on, mechanical fittings can be assembled on site. The best plan turned out to be swage at the top, stay lock at the bottom. There were several reasons why. You might notice lots of quality boats use mechanical fittings at the bottom. This is a Hylus. There are mechanical fittings, we do that as standard. I'm fascinated by the fact that a lot of builders still use swedge fittings as standard yeah. and then make mechanical fittings an option. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you're gonna start spending this kind of money, you really wanna know that you're not having to think about those things because most people are not informed about that. I did some early research with the riggers at the Annapolis Boat Show. Maybe the best way is to get a swedge fitting, uh, which you can put at the top, overlink the yeah. wires and put a mechanical fitting on the bottom. I just wanted to know what your feelings would be. I, I would sort of agree with that. Uh, having the swedge fitting at the top eliminates some problem of water getting into the swage fitting and having a mechanical fitting at the bottom allows you to get the correct rigging lengths no matter where the boat is. So yeah. if he cuts the rigging to say a foot too long then you cut it on the boat to the correct size and uh, it's all a stay lock fitting yeah. and away you go. So it's uh, yeah. And, and what do you think of stay lock fittings? I mean what's is there any disadvantage to that? I mean is it less strong than a swage fitting? Uh, no it equals the uh, breaking strength of the wire. So it's an extremely strong fitting, been around for years and years, well proven, so uh, I would, you know, I recommend a stay lock. So it's a, it's a great fitting, easy to use, easy to assemble, you can reuse it, you just have to replace the cone or the wedge and uh, away you go. It's the setup that Jade likes too. When we talked about fitting this boat out as well, you're talking about putting stay lock on the bottom. Take, take me through that, that decision, why that's, why that's a good thing. So again, it's kind of a personal opinion, but it's tried and tested opinion. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, we look at putting the uh, swage fitting at the top ends yeah. and, and that kind of uh, stops any contaminants. Uh, obviously it's pointing south. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and then with a compression, a stay lock fitting, yeah. uh, it's very, a lot more open inside yeah. or there's mo much more negative space allowing yeah. fresh water in, yeah. whether it's a hose Cause, pipe cause or rain. that's the problem, isn't it? You get stagnant water yes. that, that just sits there and, and doesn't allow air to get to the, to the, uh, the stainless steel. So then the stainless steel starts to get that crevice corrosion. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And then the perks of these uh, stay lock fittings, you can, it doesn't happen very often, but if you've got a question about it or it looks suspicious, yeah. you can unscrew the bottom end yeah. Yeah. and take it off and inspect it, Yeah. 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 which is good. Yeah. Checking your rigging is perhaps one of the most important things, and it's what Jade starts with on Fair Isle. What's your recommendations then? One about you know, how often to get a professional to come and check your rig if you if you are going to be going offshore, and and two, what do you do in in the interim as, as a skipper of your own yacht? Um, so I mean, as much as possible is the key thing, mm. um, but definitely minimally once a year, uh, yeah. you should have a rig inspection. Yeah. Uh, and that's kind of uh, whether you're sailing or not, in a sense. If the boat's in the water, yeah. it's continual. It's kind of continual uh, loadings. The boat's constantly moving. Yeah. yeah. Chafe, etc. So uh, minimally once a year. Yeah. And then if you're passage making or have plans to, then uh, b before the passage and during. Yeah. There's aspects one can do. Yeah. yeah. And then any stopover. Yeah. One. yeah. And a continual part, not just. Uh, to look for things, but to get to know what's going on up there. Yeah, and yeah. for example, you spotted some ball bearings, you said, on yeah, the deck. Yeah. Uh, you know where that's come from because yeah. you've got an idea of what's happening up yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. So if you if you see a, a, a pin from a shackle on the deck, it's yeah. your first indication of what something <laughs> yes. that might be going on. <laughs> and if you've been up there, chances are you'll have a, a visual know, of what yeah. it's come from. Yeah, and more comfortable with going up there because obviously if you've got to go up there at sea because something's got snagged, something's wrong, then you know, you've know you got to sort of be confident because that's that's not the best time to go up at the exactly. is it? Um, mostly it's psychological, it can yeah. be safe. Yeah. So take me through the things that you're looking for then. I notice at one point you're there on the spread as you're sighting down the shrouds and stuff. I mean, what's, what, what's, the, what's the sort of things you're looking for? Yeah, I mean, most uh, 
major red flag should be obvious. So, uh, you know, uh, even an untrained eye should be able to pick up a stray wire. Um, but then the details where you're kind of uh, forecasting and looking down the wires, like you say, yeah. uh, it's much easier to see a defect in the wire yeah. if you're uh, eyeballing so it straight down yeah. rather than straight on. So stray wires, fatigue, where there's uh, swage fittings yeah. that you've got on this mast. Yeah. Um, and then in the swage fittings, we're looking for longitudinal um, hairline cracks. Yeah. And that would be a red flag. Uh, use your senses, use your hands as much as possible. Yeah. Shut up edges, fingernails for cracks, like yeah. you say. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, and yeah, you'll notice I was running my hands up and down the mast. Yeah. And you can feel defects. Ah, really? Little ripples and Little stuff. Little ripples, more than you can see them. Ah. Some rigging problems and failures can be complex, but it pays to be aware of the common points of failure. So you're expecting if, if something's going to go, it probably is this, is it? Is it in your yeah. experience, is that what happens? Yes. Uh, chances are, I mean, the wire's not going to break here. It's going to break yeah. uh, down near the swage fitting. Here. Yeah. Um, obviously, there's no articulation there. And so it's also crucial that it's all toggled at the bottom end to allow the articulation yeah. in yeah. the rig. And everyone sort of says, you know, the problem with, with uh, stainless steel is that you get no warning. It's, you know, it's, it looks good one minute and, and, uh, and then just breaks the next. I mean, how, yeah. how true is that? If you're meticulous yeah. uh, and you kind of go through the process and regularly, like we said, before and after passages, or yeah. if you've been out in a blow, uh, then, then there's, the, there's no kind of reason. And you replace it within the time threshold. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's all prevention. Yeah. yeah, all prevention. We should talk about that as well, the time threshold. It's usually sort of 10 years, people are saying. And I mean, is that for insurance purposes? Is that what you would recommend if insurance wasn't a thing? If it was, you know, just going on what you know to be good and what not to be good? Yeah, I mean, uh, fundamentally, yes, 10 year plan, it comes from insurance companies. Uh, fundamentally, it's kind of history of the boat mm. and intentions of the boat. So if you're setting off kind of a, on a voyage around the world, then one would do it as default. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, um, but equally, if you're sailing around the bay, you can kind of, uh, you can keep an eye on it regularly. Yeah. Because you see people, you know, they say, well, you know, they've got 30 year old rigging and it's all, it's all, they're also all still fine, they yeah. say. Um, I mean, would you say that's, that's just an accident waiting to happen no matter what or, you know, what's It's what's kind of, well, yeah, it's a material thing. You know, eventually it will give up. Yeah. That's the, uh, yeah. the uh, fact. And that's why we're changing our standing rigging, purely age. Jade isn't finding any visible red light problems. We also talked to our insurers, GJW, who sent us this guidance. Rigging should be replaced on average at 10 yearly intervals. However, how you sail and the atmospheric conditions your vessel is exposed to could affect the overall lifespan of rigging. It is your responsibility to maintain the rigging in a serviceable condition, as this is not a feature of your insurance policy. You should regularly inspect and replace any worn items if in any doubt, you should seek guidance from a qualified rigging expert. So all chain plates have to be checked, along with the bolts that hold them. Okay, so that's the first one out, and actually looks like it's perfect to me. Obviously, I'll let Jade have a look at that and uh, probably get a magnifying glass on it, but no, that's, that's, quite, that's quite good. I was expecting some sort of marking on it, but it looks, looks brand new, actually. Um, so yeah, I need to get a few more out and then have a bit of a clean up of all this all the stainless steel I mean I've said it many times before but it bears repeating uh, it's not just about how it looks it's uh, it's to keep it in, in good condition is the, the polishing that you need and actually what I am going to do is go through it with some barkeepers friend which I think is the quickest way to get the rust off and use a, um, a sheepskin pad I've got an old polishing pad for that because it sort of just gets in there well and falls it off really quickly I've even got one on the end of a the end of a drill as well to get into the little bits that you can't sort of rub that well and then just whatever polish you've got uh, this one actually works quite well 3m's polish as well i mean whatever good metal restorer type polish you can have uh, give it a polish with that and uh, get it all shiny and new and then hopefully it'll stay like that for uh, for longer if you've actually you know not just cleaned it polished it uh, tends to stay a bit longer so got to get all that off and all this staining off from around here I want to take some of these boats out as well. Jade rig checked some other boats while he was here. It's always good to tag along to see what he might find. Where you've got the diamonds yeah. bisecting like that, uh, they're rubbing, they're up against each other. It's, it's soaring through 
30, 40 percent of one of the strands there. Yeah. Uh, for me, that's not going to last the duration of the rig. So are there any major differences with, with catamarans as to, to monohulls of, of what, you, what you look for, different stress points, different bits that sort of go before uh, they would on a monohull or, or uh, you know, are easier on a They're much a uh, higher loading. Everything's kind of uprated. So I think this is a 44 foot, yeah. Mm. Um, so you wouldn't have this size rigging generally on a 44 foot no. monohull. Yeah. Um, basically because they don't heel over with a, with a monohull. Uh, the when you're sailing and the boat heels over, this wind spills out the yes, top. Whereas yeah. this is just gonna, unless the boat's moving forward. Yeah. Um, it's much bigger loading on the rig, um, and they're rigged differently. So the rig is like a tripod as opposed to uh, like a monohull. Yeah. Um, mostly because of the structure of the boat. Uh, so having shrouds that came down uh, to catch the end of the spreaders would mean you'd have terminations much further inboard. Yeah. Yeah. But you can get in problems, can't you, because of that, because you've got such sturdy rigging. Um, I mean, I don't know if it still happens with modern boats, but older boats you find, you know, you can actually pull the boat apart. You know, it yep. starts to move them. And I know, you know, certain brands at the moment are getting problems with bulkheads and they're, and they're putting down that down maybe to, to over-tensioning rigging. Definitely. And uh, <coughs> take that into account when you're tensioning it. You know, not just focusing on the rigging, but look at what actual make and model of the boat you're on. Yeah. Age and, like you said, classic yeah. boats. Yeah. So Jay, do you, you mean looking at this mast with a shoe, then on the pad, do you prefer that to the, the other ones that we've seen, which is you know it's just on a, a bottom here with an insert? Is there yeah. a difference? So generally, if you've got this uh, kind of cast aluminium pad that's attached to the mast that then sits on the mast base, there's a bit of adjustment fore and aft mm. for the rake. So the pad it might be on this one, yeah, is not. Uh, completely flat. Yeah, it's, it's, kind of it's, yeah. It's flat. given. It's given the right, yeah, shape, yeah. so that it sits so, properly. So it's so it's flat, but the, you've got the right rake on. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it allows you to put some rake in the mast. Yeah. Uh, without putting undue load on the uh, trailing edge of yeah. the profile. Yeah. It's not just sitting on the edge. Yeah. yeah. And equally important, so minor adjustment. Yeah. Back on Fair Isle, and the boat's fittings were all deemed good to go. But all standing rigging from clevis pin to clevis pin is being changed on age grounds alone. Stay locker supplying the wire as well as they are one of the few suppliers Jade trusts for quality. We have them all cut slightly over length with a swage fitting at one end to go on top. But before removing any old standing rigging, Jade wants to tension everything properly. This is because we are going to use them as a guide to cut the new wires to. So with the tension gauge here, you're just looking for a percentage of the, the the breaking strain of the wire is that right because it, people sort of tend to think that you know when it comes to rigging oh you can put a thicker wire on and then it make the rig stronger but that's that's not true is it really i mean it is to an, to an extent but it's not just the wire it's everything yeah you know uh, then you're kind of playing with tensions on the mast all the fittings on the mast the mast itself yeah yeah chain plates what the chain plates are bolted to and the, the, the structural structure of the boat. So you can't just kind of go up in size wire and say that the boat's stronger because yeah. you know, potentially you could be weakening uh, everything else. Yes, because because it's sort of more than just sort of the weakest link, isn't it? It's the fact that if you're putting stronger wire on, and tell me if I'm right with this, if you're putting stronger wire on, you then got to tension that more because you, what you're working to is, is a percentage of the, the breaking strain of the wire. Exactly yeah. that. So yeah, you, you could go, uh, if you go up a, you know, up a diameter, then everything at you, the tension's got to go up and yeah. to, to get the correct value. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the boats are designed around, this boat will be designed around 10 mil yeah. caps. And if you put 12 on it, um, you've got to do some surgery elsewhere. Yeah. To, in some to ways it's a bit sort of counterintuitive because you, you, you'd think, okay, you know, you're going to, you know, if just up the size of this wire a little bit, just so that the wire itself isn't so much of a, of a weak link, and but you wouldn't tension it any more than the other one. But but you're saying you have to do that. You, yeah. Part yeah, of how you Part of it is, yeah. is that because um, you you, you want to get rid of any fatigue, and to do that, you've got to have rig tension, and to keep the mast in place and yeah. know, stop any of this movement. So. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's critical to have the, the correct tension. So it's one thing to go along and give the wire a bit of a pull to find out r roughly where you are, but to do it properly you need the gauge. It, it, show, me, show me how the gauge actually works then, what are you looking for? Yeah, so I mean there's there's different gauges out there, yeah. and uh, depending on how much money you want to spend as much as anything, but yeah. there's some really good uh, 
um, uh, digital gauges for it. But this is a uh, one you'll see on most boats. Yeah. And certainly on racing boats yeah. is a uh, lose gauge, um, and it gives you a simple graph. Uh, all the calcs are kind of worked out already for you. Yeah. So and you're looking for that percentage of breaking strain uh, of the wire for setting it. Um, and so yeah, it just goes on like so. Yeah. And then this is a 10 mil one by 19 wire. Yeah. And what you do is read read the top, yeah. set it. So we're on 45. Yeah. Here. And you come down down the graph here to it goes from 43 to 47. Uh, so we're on 10 mil wire 47 so uh, it's actually rubbed out a bit there about 15 percent yeah which is what we're looking for okay we want the mast to have some rake and pre-bend and it's the standing rigging that defines that obviously exaggerated a bit here so the tension is dependent on the wire size and the angle it bisects with the mast but you can hold the mast in the right position at different tensions let's show that with the shrouds if we tighten one side, the mast will be pulled that way, but then tighten the other side and the mast will go back into true. But both sides are now at a higher tension. So just because your mast shape and position is good doesn't mean your tensions are right. So all the tensions, the rake, the pre-bend, um, and that we're happy with, happy with it all before we, take, uh, uh, before we mark it up to use them as data marks for the uh, for the new rigging. Yeah, so you've just looked at the, the rake of the mast there just to see what we've got in yeah. the rake and you want one degree, yeah? So Yeah, one to two degrees on a, uh, a boat like this for sure. Yeah. Uh, that's what we're looking for. So you're just looking on the online calculator for the for the length to see how far back that was. And that was what, yeah. about, about um, 300 mil? Yeah, between 250, 300 mil yeah. at the bottom. So uh, yeah, I mean, I use online calculator because yeah failed at school but <laughs> there are obviously other ways of working it out yeah so you, with, with that sort of you think it, you've, you've got things about right so so what are you going to do now you're going to look, look at the tensions that we've got already and where the where the bottle screws are, are you just to see yeah so we're going to walk around the whole rig now and make sure we've got uh, uh, the rig is tensioned correctly uh, as I said before that's either a 10 minute job or an all-day job yeah so if it's out it'd be nice to set the mast up so that um, it's as we want it when we've tensioned up with the new rigging yeah uh, so yeah that's that's plan b yeah or and, and looking at what we've two. got here now i mean you'd expect you know with older rigging i would have expected maybe this to have you know, had to be tightened up and be a bit further down is that what you'd expect to have for sure but who knows i mean it might be that the uh the rigger who who dressed it initially uh took it into account already yeah. So he might have started with a further open bottle screw and then yeah. uh, tighten it. Yeah. Yes. And what you're aiming at to try and get length then as regards to the bottle screws? How, how so once it's tensioned up, we're, we're aiming to, I mean, different riggers have different opinions, mm. but just a bit further open than half or halfway yeah. once it's fully tensioned. Once it's fully tensioned. And fully tensioned. That's for the initial tensioning because you're going to be tensioning once, you know, in the first couple of weeks, aren't you? You know, the first couple of sales, you're going to be tensioning. Once. Yeah, so when I say fully tensioned, it will be after the first season or uh, oh, okay. the first period. So yeah, yeah. Um, it's, not com it's not complete until uh, one sailed the boat for a month or two. Yeah. Next step is to mark the bottle screws with tape as we have to loosen them to get the clevis pin out and this means we can screw them back out to the right place to get the length to measure. Then we support the mast with halyards as we remove and replace the rigging one part at a time. The way Jade is up the mast there, I'll just prepare the, uh, the whiskers which I'm going to go in here so all this has to, to come out so everything is tensioned to the to the right tension should, should be the right length so we're just going to take that off and then measure this up the whisker to the to the same length so to do that first of all prepare the the bottle screw now if you're not familiar with all the bottle screws is basically they have a, a left hand thread and a right hand thread um, and they will go on like so so you just get one so one side is is just in and then same with the other just a half a turn and then you can just turn the middle and they will pull both ends in. You don't want to be just getting them uneven, turning one end and not the other. Do everything from the middle and it will pull them evenly in. I've put some grease on. I'm just using actually some of this uh, Selden stuff that came with the, uh, the furler. I have a little dot on the bottom. 
so you can get them right, around the right way. That normally goes on the bottom when you fit them. That's the sort of standard way of doing it, left hand thread at the bottom. So we'll take this in. It's definitely got to have enough that the threads are just out, but you're trying to gauge then how much it, it stretches. As we said before, there's not gonna be much stretch because there's not much length in the whiskers here. So this will probably be all right to where we want it to be, which is gonna be almost halfway. Imagine with this one. Uh, and then we'll leave it there, set it to that length. So that's the length that it'll end up when it's the same length as the, the one that's on there. So, uh, so yeah, we can, we can loosen this so it makes it easy to put on and then tighten up to, to that. But yeah, that's what it is. Really nice. I really like these, uh, these bottle screws. They're machined, not forged, these ones, stainless steel. They're very nice. So I noticed Jade, as you're doing this, you've got, a, you've got a technique to make this easier if it's a little bit tight. Explain what you're doing. Uh, so basically, rather than trying to, uh, holding the stud at the top and trying to turn the body of the box screw um, in a single turn, what I do is allow the, allow the stud to go with you. Yeah. Like so. And then turn it back. So you're only tightening one thread at one time. Yeah, you tie at the top and, and then the bottom. Correct, yeah. Yeah. Or the bottom and the top. Bottom and the top, yeah. Um, but yeah, it just makes life 50% easier. Yeah. Um, obviously not an issue with the smaller turn buckles or if you've got big spanners, but most boats don't have anything much bigger than this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, of this size, anyway. Yeah, what sort of differences do you find with, with different boats that, that you're rigging, you know, different production boats, different strengths of boats and things that make a difference to, to how you prepare the rig and, and how you tension it? Yeah, I mean, um, so a lot of the uh, production boats, uh, one would, if you step the mast when she's ashore, when they're ashore, uh, you'd leave the final tensioning, so just pinch everything up and then make sure, you, and then tune it when it's in the water, um, so allowing the boat to settle yeah. in the water before tuning it, as opposed to on the hard where the stresses are different. Yeah. Well, yeah. there's, so, there's just that difference of having the water supporting the hull, that the hull shape might, might change. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly that. Is, that. is that common then? I mean, are you talking about sort of fast racing boats there or just a, just a normal production boat? Uh, production boats, yeah. you know, to, yeah, without naming all of them. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. production, generally production boats. Um, and even with new rigging on an old mast, on a production boat, you'd do the same thing if it was on the hard. You'd kind of replace the standing rigging, but do the final tune. Uh, in the water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And has it always been like that, or is this a more, a more sort of modern thing with modern boats as they're sort of changing and not maybe not being as strong? What's what's happening? So uh, yeah, basically, um, it, I mean it's always been like that because boats originally wooden boats would always move when they went in the water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'd like to speak speak to a rigger from 50, 60 years ago and see see how they did it yeah. specifically. Um, but yeah, I can imagine it was the same. Um, so, yeah. so rigging a, 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 mo a modern production boat is more akin to, to, to having an old wooden <laughs> boat. You've got to treat it in the same sort yeah. of ways. It makes this one feel easy, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Coming up in part two, how to get everything measured. So I've set the original bottle screws to where I mark them on the deck. The best way to fit a stay lock terminal. Okay. So yeah, you've got a Assembling bit. what has to be said is a fantastic Selden furler and much more, don't miss it. Please do remember to subscribe, it costs you nothing and really helps us out. And consider supporting us on Patreon so we can keep these films coming. Thanks for watching.